right, hello everyone, uh, welcome. I'm glad you're all here. It's gonna be a great event. Thank you, Amani, for coming here. Um, just to describe myself, I'm a older white man with charcoal and chalk colored hair. I wear glasses. I have a Black, uh, Black Lives uh, t-shirt, Black Lives Matter t-shirt on, and um, I'm really happy to be here and happy you're here. Um, does somebody else, Leslie, do you want to introduce yourself? Oh, you're Leslie. I will when I do the breath, community breath. You can go ahead with the land acknowledgement. Okay, and let me, uh, I'm, and I'm also, I'm from Cal State East Bay, and this, we have a, a, a CFA California land acknowledgement because you're from all over the state. Uh, we want to acknowledge that we gather as a California Faculty Association on the traditional land of the indigenous people past and present and honor with gratitude the land itself and the people who have stewarded it through the generations. This calls us to commit to continuing to learn how to be better stewards of the land that we inhabit as well. To recognize the land as an expression of gratitude and appreciation to those whose territory we reside on and a way of honoring the indigenous people who have been living on and working on the land from time immemorial. It is important to understand the long-standing history that has brought us to reside on the land and to seek to understand our place within that history. Land acknowledgements do not exist in a past tense or historical context. Colonialism is a current ongoing process and we need to build our mindfulness to our present participation. Acknowledging the land is an important indigenous protocol that we are honoring here today. Okay, and there's a link in the chat if you want to find out whose land you are on. I'm, on, I'm in Oakland and I'm on Chichone Ohlone land. Hi everyone, my name is Leslie Bryan. I am a slightly older African-American woman, uh, light-skinned red, as my relatives would say. I have curly hair and I'm today wearing just a nice black shirt, uh, neutral color so that I wouldn't stand out in the crowd so that our speakers can stand out. So I'm gonna do, and I'm from San Bernardino, Cal State San Bernardino. Now I'd like to introduce, we're very lucky to have Imani Barberin. Sorry, Imani Barberin here today. Uh, and she's, the topic is crutches and spice. Imani Barberin is a disability rights and inclusion activist and speaker who uses her voice and social media platforms to create conversations engaging the disability community. Born with cerebral palsy, Imani often writes and uses her platform to speak from the perspective of a disabled black woman. Thank you very much, Armani. Thank you all for having me. I am really honored to be here. I love working with educators. Um, my mom was a closet educator when I was younger, um, quite often making me do extra homework on top of the homework I already had. Um, eventually she got her teaching degree and that stopped. Um, but I, re I really do have a heart for teachers and educators because I have had some really excellent ones growing up who um, allowed me to really engage in my disability identity and really um, made sure that I was comfortable and included in everything that class had to offer, including field days, including fun moments. Um, as discussed, my name is Amani Barber and I am a disability rights and inclusion activist. I love talking about disability um, and how it inter interacts with my other um, identities. And it can be very difficult for people to understand that I am a whole person, right? When, you, when people look at me, a lot of people think, uh, if I'm sitting, they think of my skin color. If I'm standing with my crutches, they think of my disability. Um, in sometime, only sometimes they think of me as a woman. Um, very rarely do they think of me as a bisexual woman. So when we talk about disability, it's really important to understand that the person before you with a disability is an entire person, that there are different identities that live underneath this skin that a lot of people will not interact with or even acknowledge. So let's discuss what is ableism. Ableism 
is the Interpersonal Institutional Societal Discrimination Against Disabled People. I grew up not really having a word for ableism. I kind of knew what it felt like, but I didn't have a word for it until I became an adult. So growing up, I didn't know why, quite why people weren't inviting me places. I had an instinct as to why, but I didn't quite know. When I was um, about nine years old, I was playing on a school playground and my and one of the popular girls was about to have a birthday party. I was so excited, so, so, so excited. But everybody got an invite, invite except for me. And I, was, and I was like, well, let me go and check because sometimes things get lost in the mail. I realize it is a school cubby mailbox, but mail the distribution is very shoddy these days. So I went up to this girl and I said, well, can I, can I have my invite? You said you were gonna invite me. And she told me that I could come as long as nobody else did. And that was kind of my first instinct that I wasn't wanted around, um, that I was very much so um, being judged by my body, excuse me, being judged because of my body. And when I told my mother this story that same afternoon, my mother looked at me and said, I don't care who is, who is or who is not going to that girl's birthday party you're not her second choice, you're not going regardless. And so I've always had strong, particularly black women around me, reorienting who I am and making sure that I know that I'm okay as I am. Disability is often very difficult to talk about amongst black folk, particularly black people who were assigned female at birth. Disability is often seen as yet another marginalization that can discount us from existing in public space. When I talk about disability, I try to talk about disability from a disabled black perspective because it makes sense for my identity. And for much of my life, I was really the only disabled black kid in any given classroom or in any given room even. And so seeing myself represented was very difficult. I would ask my dad when we were watching music videos or TV or any of those things. They're like, well, where are the disabled black people? And my dad would tell me, well, you know, there's Stevie Wonder and, and Ray Charles and all these disabled black folk, but they never let their disability get to them. Don't let it get to you. And my dad in his, was trying to be helpful, but I wanted to know what that was like. I needed somebody to speak to those things. And so that's why I started my first blog. It was to crutchesandspice.com to, talk about being black while being disabled. And I found my life's work by sitting in a room with people who looked exactly like me. In 2014, I was invited to the White House um, to hear a panel on disability, educate, disability education in the African-American community. And every single kid around me, every single kid around me had experiences that mirrored my own while I was growing up through grade school, and even sometimes during college. One child talked about how his teacher kept trying to, kept trying to um, give him a, a special diploma. For those who don't know, if you are in, in a couple of states, if you are a disabled person who is in high school, they can offer you a special diploma that is not actually a GED and not actually a high school diploma. It's, it's basically a ceremony to pass you along to just the next stage of your life. And what winds up happening is that because of these diplomas, um, kids can't, the kids who graduate cannot get jobs because they don't actually have a high school diploma. Um, and luckily his mother caught that and said, no, I, I want my child to have their GED. But these types of experiences are very, very common amongst our society. One of the things you need to understand about disability and race is that disability, excuse me, racism is inherently disabling. Racism is meant to disable. Every form of racism, including environmental, medical, structural, interpersonal, is meant to disable those who are unwanted in society. If you go to the doctor and the doctor is not believing you about your disability, then the, the issue is gonna be exacerbated until you show quote unquote evidence 
of your illness. If you live in a neighborhood that is close to a highway or has a food desert um, or has a lot of traffic around it, you are more than likely to develop asthma and respiratory issues as you're born and grow up. Um, if you are somebody who uh, is living in poverty um, and is utilizing the system to get to for the user, utilizing the social safety net as you should, you will likely be isolated by society because of disability regulations. Um, that's why no, marriage equality doesn't exist for disabled people. So every form of racism is disabling, is isolating, and is meant to dispose of those who are not quote unquote valuable to our society. One in five people will experience disability as they age, but one in three native people will have a disability in their lifetime. One in three, one in three um, native people have a disability currently. 25% uh, of black people have a disability. Those are the two groups in this society that have all whose existence on this land, whose existence in society has always been put into question by society. So it is no mistake that disability is high, the rates of disability are high in these communities. So what happens when we combine race and disability? How do we talk about these things? Not only is racism disabling, but Having a disability is incredibly dangerous. It is very much so, um, you are very much so at the mercy of the system. For instance, um, 30 to 50% of people killed by police have a disability. Um, 30 to 40% of those in jails and prisons have a disability. That's alarming considering we only really make up about 20 to 25% of the population. We are overrepresented in carceral systems. When I started along this work, I started talking, I started thinking about what abolition or what a new society looks like for disabled folks, particularly disabled people um, who are black, indigenous, uh, and otherwise marginalized. And I had such a hard time envisioning the future, right? I, I kept thinking to myself, what do these systems look like when we are working together and, and have one another and hold one another? What does that look like to be able to do? And I realized that the very first thing that a white supremacist society, that a capitalistic society will take from you Will rob you of is your ability to imagine a world without it. Think about it. We are so bogged down by this every single day that it's hard to even look from a bird's eye view and say maybe we can rearrange things so that people are treated better, better, so that people have the ability to live out their lives with freedom. I think the only thing that we can think about throughout abolition work is what is not what freedom will look like, but how freedom will feel. I wanna live unafraid. I wanna live unafraid that just because I make a minor mistake or a mishap or, I'm, or tragedy befalls me that my life is not over. That just because I need medical care doesn't mean that I'm forced into bankruptcy. That just because I was reaching for my cell phone, that I'm not shot because people thought I was reaching for a gun. That people can no longer fear having to put food on the table and needing transportation and not knowing how to get to work or how they're going to be a part of society. I want there to be a, a place where there's no fear and that there is space for everyone and everybody has space that is recognized for them. I can't tell you what that'll look like. I could collaborate with you to make sure that we are caring for um, and anticipating as many needs as possible, but I can definitely tell you what that feels like. We have to envision as a society how we are going to build towards freedom with no lesson plan.
there are several writers that have come before us to talk about abolition. But how does that look like? What does that look like now with our society? With everything feeling so polarized and mer mercurial all at the same time. I decided when I started this work that I was gonna live unapologetically. That is my version of freedom. That I'm going to press upon the moments that I exist right now, that I'm going to be free because I refuse, I refuse to not feel freedom even while it, it feels very hard to attain because I may never get to a place where I feel that entirely. I may never get to a place where I may never make it to the promised land of abolition inclusion, but I can tell myself that I can exemplify and show to everybody else what that means to me. I'm very much, the, I grew up very Christian in a very Christian household. And I got really tired as an adult of people telling me what they were about, right? I was really tired of that. I was exhausted of people telling me all of these arbitrary rules and these laws and then not living them out themselves. They had every single direction for everybody else, but the, the thought that they would be, have to come up and, and answer to their own uh, issues that never occurred to them. We have this idea that we could project outwards what the world is supposed to look like. But for me, I want to live it. I don't want to tell you. I don't want to have to be seen doing the right thing. I don't want to have to be seen performing allyship and inclusivity. I just want to be a part of it. I just want to make sure it happens. I would rather walk away from this earth knowing that nobody knows anything about any of the good things I've done. As a disabled person, I get really, really, really uncomfortable with the idea of inspiration, right? And with social media, it makes it worse. Oh my goodness, how many videos have you seen of the homeless people being handed money and um, food and housing? And the person who is doing all of these actions are actually just extolling themselves. How many videos have you seen of um, disabled people being brought to prom? Like it's a special, like it's not commonplace to just go to prom, to just be a part of the moment. I don't ever wanna be seen put on display as being the right thing to do, if that makes sense. I want to live it. So how do we do that? For me, freedom starts with talking about our own internalized ableism. I carried a lot of that with me growing up. I thought I had to outrun every, well, not outrun, I don't really run anywhere, but <laughs> I thought I had to outperform everybody around me. I made sure that I took on activities that made sure that people could not put me in a box because I was afraid that if people saw me as disabled, as people, if people saw me as other, I would be disposable. I would be counted out. So I made all of the jokes. I made all of everybody smile. I'm very charming if I wanna be. And I used that <laughs> to make sure that I was included in places. But after a while, that stopped being able to save me. And I started crumbling because when you pull yourself apart so that other people feel more comfortable, you are no longer walking through the world as a whole person. When you pull yourself apart so that people feel more comforted by your presence, then where does that leave you? In college, I found myself, excuse me, I found myself during my sophomore year of college locked in my room for two months because everything I had been taught about how to navigate my disability didn't work. 
I was snowed into my room one day and just never left, really. Because I'd been taught not to ask for help, not explicitly, but I was told to do everything on my own. I didn't know that I could just ask for accommodations. I know that sounds ridiculous now, but I didn't know that like, that was my right as a student. I didn't know that I could ask professors to help me. I didn't wanna be seen by them as less intelligent or less capable of being in their classroom. So I stayed in my room and I withered away because if I couldn't accomplish what I had set out to do, then I was failing. My dad came and got me um, after not having talked to him in a while because he was so concerned. And he took me home and, and he said, you need help. You need help figuring out who you are in the midst of all this. And, it, and I was able to go to therapy and transfer schools. And I had professors that were dedicated to allowing me to, uh, to explore my disability identity. And I found the words of people like Stella Young and Alice Wong and Audre Lorde. And I realized that disability history, disabled Black history, disabled BIPOC history is all around me. And that I wasn't alone. It had felt like I couldn't relate my experiences to other people because I had been taught that if I needed or leaned on anybody else, they wouldn't want me around for very long. Additionally, I constantly overworked myself in the hopes that I looked more productive, that I didn't look lazy. I think of lazy as a, as a type of dog whistle for ableism, right? Because who's really being called lazy? People who are taking rest, people who may not be giving into these ideas of productivity and capitalism, who it really does, um, who really does exhibit laziness in our society? versus who has called it, but I digress. So I want you to ask yourselves, I want you to ask yourselves, what are you doing every single day to, to outperform how other people think of you? What are, how are you interacting with your life so that you are seen as valuable? I realized that I was going to be seen the way I was gonna be seen regardless. And that how other people felt about me could not dictate how I felt about myself. And that's, that's easy to say. It's easy to say, it's really hard to do. A lot of our lives are dictated by our ability to fit in and to, and to cope with the whiteness and the lack of inclusion around us. But I really want you to ask yourself, how do I feel about who I am and my own body and my own productivity and my own mind? How do I feel about that? Because I can guarantee you that the way you feel to, about your own ability or disability or illness is likely the way you will project onto others in this work. The way that you think about your own capacity will, think, will determine how you think about somebody else's capacity. How you feel about your own ableism, how you express your own ableism has a lot to do with the work that you've left undone. So when I talk about living disabled, loud and proud, I mean no longer splitting myself up into pieces for people. This is it, this is all you get, right? I walk into every room with crutches, a fat body, not F-A-T, not P-H-A-T, a fat body and red hair and tattoos because I want to be the person I am. I'm no longer making people comfortable in my presence. 
I don't need to. Because the people who will stay will stay. The people who will think of me as other can go. Living disabled out of proud means claiming my disability. I am okay with being disabled. I like my life. I like my body. I like the way it moves. I like the single patient of my crutches on the floor. I like the way I sway sometimes when my body just is computing what balance means that day. I like me. And I don't and I don't always feel that way about my disability. That's okay. Because I realize that I don't have to like my disability to like me in those moments. I can make sure that I see myself for who I am because I'm the only one that's gonna get that right. Claiming your disability can be very difficult, particularly if you are black or brown. And I am not going to tell you that you have to right now. Everybody is in, on their own journey. I will never force particularly black and brown folks to identify as disabled. I know the risks, I know the fears. But what I would ask you is what are you not getting by not asking for help, by not admitting to yourself that you need rest and re restoration and time to yourself? That's what I would ask you. What are you missing out on? So how do we build this inclusive society? How do we encourage other people to shout to the rooftops that they are okay with themselves, that they are proud to be disabled? Understanding your own voice is important. I will always encourage people to tell their own stories. What is your story? Storytelling is incredibly important for any sort of advocacy that you do. I think of it as like a spear, the tip of a spear, right? It's the thing that connects you to some, well, a little bit of a violent metaphor, but <laughs> I think of your storytelling as an, as an incredible way into somebody else's mind. Telling your own story can help other people identify with you, can feel like they are less alone. And they'll wanna hear more of your experiences because for the first time, they have somebody who represents them and that's you. Encouraging other people to tell their stories and building narratives around disability and certain issues is community building. We always discount a lot of you know, the arts and and you know this you know this the soft subjects we always try to defund them from schools but they are the most powerful the ability to express yourself however you see fit however you are able that's the point i want your story however you feel comfortable saying it i want to know it i want to know you i want to know who you are how you see yourself not how other people see you, how you see yourself. We need to tell stories, we need to create art. We need to build spaces that are inclusive. Every space should take into account disability because everybody is liable to be subject to disability. Everybody deserves inclusivity and accommodations. We are entitled to those things. So when you're creating this art, when you're creating space that is, that is um, building and encouraging others, make sure it's accessible. Make sure that there's closed captioning and ASL translation. If you're in a physical space, make sure that there's a quiet room for those with autism and sensory needs. Make sure that there are clear marked exits and accessible bathrooms. And you know what? If you, in, if you involve dis disabled people from the beginning of any planning process, I can guarantee you the right things will be thought about and discussed.
making sure you include us at every stage of any process is important, of any conversation is important, of any piece of advocacy is important. And I also want you to understand that disability advocacy doesn't have to be flashy. I am, um, I'm not a belligerent advocate online, but I am very well, I, I, I do have an attitude uh, online. And a lot of people like to gravitate towards my online content because of my personality um, and like to put me on a pedestal. I don't really wanna be on a pedestal, but also there's a lot of advocacy that does not involve being seen. How many of you go on walks every day? How many of you go to the grocery store or the supermarket? Have you ever noticed cracks in the sidewalk in your neighborhood? That's dangerous to a person in a wheelchair. Maybe report it to your city to make sure it's fixed. Have you, do you see that there's like a narrowness in your community grocery store that makes it difficult for people on crutches or walkers to maneuver? Maybe talk to the manager to make sure the aisles are wider. Disability advocacy is really just community work and community inclusion. And the person behind you, the person, the next person that comes after you may never know it was you that helped them, but it will mean the world that they are, that they are in an accessible environment that they can navigate with autonomy. That means everything to disabled people our autonomy and our inter interdependence. And we can see the, 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 that there are ripple effects to not relying on one another, to not feeling like you can rely on one another. This pandemic is a perfect example of that. This idea of getting back to normal and demasking and doing whatever you want now because everybody's liable to get it. Our health is a group project. Our accessibility is a group project. We need one another. And we need one another to, to tell each other that it's gonna be okay, that we're going to figure it out together, that we're gonna collaborate and include one another. I hope above all hopes that you all walk away from this talk understanding that disability will affect all of our lives eventually. And the path forward includes disabled people. And that means understanding your own privilege and internalized ableism. It means understanding what your community needs. It means understanding yourself and the world around you in a way that builds inclusivity going forward. I want to be every one of you to be comfortable in your own skin, to be comfortable in your environments. And I think that that is the exact society that we can work towards. Thank you. Wonderful. I'm so, I'm sitting here just so full of every emotion uh, based on your, your, your comments and, and just wonderful, wonderful. And so I'm gonna um, get, remind everyone that you can put questions in the Q and A and then I will um, read them for you, Mani, right? Is, you know, but I, I have one right now, but I just wanna um, let everyone know that you, it's still open. You can put questions in there. So we have one that, <laughs> excuse me, that has a comment and then a question afterwards. <clears throat> it says, our identities are a collection of characteristics such mm -hmm. as skin, color, gender, disability, age, profession, 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 I can't talk, et cetera. If we lose or gain attributes, our identities shift. We behave according to our own perceptions of those characteristics. Others read us according to their own perceptions. How do you think we can change how others read us by our own behavior that contradicts their negative perceptions of disabilities? How do we act on our own perceptions with less influence from others? That's a lot. That is a long question. Uh, I really do appreciate it, Vicki. Um, let me put this. Who do you want in your life, right? 
I really, you know, when it comes to, I'm fairly privileged to be able to say this, but um, I really try not to involve too many people uh, to like fight down any people that I don't see in my future. Um, I protect my peace in that way. Um, and it's really hard because you want to be able, you want people to see you the way you see yourself or at least see you in a way that you have worked towards achieving. Um, what I would say is spend your energy on the people that you feel are closest to you and having them understand and build community with them and making sure that you have a safe space to retreat from all of this nonsense in the world right now. Um, that's the most important thing. Um, what I would say is that they should undo their perceptions of capacity. Mm -hmm. uh, we have this idea based off of disability. When you look at a person, you could assume their capacity. You could assume a whole bunch of things about a disabled person just, look, just by looking at them, right? Um, and it takes a really long time to undo that behavior. But what I recommend people do is give, pe give people a second chance every time in your mind to make a first impression. I know that that sounds ridiculous because you don't know these people all the time, but our, our brain is gonna you know, set, send these signals to us and be like, this is what they think, this is what they believe, this is what, you know, how they feel about things, um, this is what they are capable of based off of just looking at their, their disability. Um, and I want you to actually make the conscious decision, decision to go, actually, let me take a step back. Let me just let them speak for themselves. Let me, um, let me just be quiet <laughs> and, and let people identify themselves in the way that they um, see fit and see as, as appropriate for themselves. Um, yeah, that's how I think you can act on your own perceptions, really just undoing that notion of capacity um, because everybody has the capacity to lead, do good, be harmful, um, we're just people when it comes to disability, we're really just people. And so understanding that that is your instinct and then working against that and giving yourself extra time is the most important thing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I, I have a question for um, myself. It's, I didn't put it in the chat because I can't figure out how to do that. I mean, in the Q and A. <laughs> so I'm just going to say it out loud. Um, earlier you were talking about, um, you know, identification, uh, when people see you and, and, and how they identify you as a disabled person and that you have to reorient yourself, right? Mm -hmm. That little conversation you had there. And so I was thinking about, um, I have a, a young cousin, she's in high school, has Kabuki syndrome, and mm -hmm. she goes through this right now of people identifying her a certain way, what she can't, it's always what she can't do. But in reality, there's what, a lot what she can do. And so as um, speaking, for, uh, this is a student. And so for faculty, how can we help students in that moment to help for them to reorient themselves, right? You know, no matter what you're teaching, if you have students in your class and, you know, the younger they are, I feel like they're really going through that sense of um, identity. How as a, a, a teacher at whatever level, university, most of us, or even uh, younger, help students do this. You were mentioning that you had a good support system. You know, if we're teachers, we're like that other support system, right? And some yeah. students may not have that at home. So, you know, what can we do as teachers, faculty, uh, to help students reorient themselves when they've been given this message? Does that make sense what I'm asking? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, I think the best thing is to speak from the lens of expansion. Um, mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is, um, a lot of people approach accommodations and be like, so what can't you do? What, what, right. What's difficult for you? What, what, what do you need to work on? When in reality, you could speak it from, you could ask them, hey, I, I, think, I think you're gonna do well here, but listen, let's make sure you have everything you need to get where you're going. You know, let's, let's support you with accommodations. You know, have you thought about um, what you may need for this class or for, um, this, this session or for this um, lecture, mm -hmm. how can I help you, how, how can I get help you get there? Um, do you need me? Like, do you, would you like for me to help you help advocate for yourself? Um, speaking in such a way that they don't feel like they are approaching their disability from a scarcity of talents mm -hmm. and uh, skills, 
but from an abundance of support. Mm. So that making it feel like they have you to talk to in case they need accommodations or need like a liaison with administration. Right. Um, because I, I, like I said, I see that all the time. And it really does take undoing that internalized ableism because from the perspective of a non-disabled person or somebody who doesn't have experience with disability at all, disability means lacking. Um, for me, disability just means that my body functions differently. Um, so when you talk from this perspective, a lens of lacking, it will bleed into how you approach disabled kids and how they need accommodations and support. Does that make sense? Yes, I might. I was on mute because my dog's barking. But yes, <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> that totally makes sense. You know, we get um, forms from the Office for Students with Disabilities on what they need. And I've always felt I can do more than that than what's on this piece of paper. And I like that thought of having the conversation and spinning it the other way. Like, you know, you can do this. Tell me how to help you do it. Right. Yeah. And I think, too, uh, particularly kids who so there's, there's also like a technology gap when kids reach college. Like if you aren't exposed to disability resources as a child, as somebody who was born with a disability, you don't know, you may not know what technology is available to you and what might work for you. I mean, it takes a lot of experimentation and a lot of schools do not like it because they think, oh, well, there's a limited amount of resources. We can't buy up everything so that they could try everything. Um, so I'm going to, so the, the child and the counselor will probably think of the most conservative way mm. to get from point A to point B rather than um, spending the time to make technology available to them so they could try out accessibility. And this is particularly true of children who are uh, young adults who are, uh, come from low income backgrounds or from um, racialized households um, who just may not have that, had the same access because you know, medical racism, like all these different factors for whatever reason. So I think it's also really important to note that, that, that there is a really big gap um, and they may not even know themselves what accommodations they need or can even ask for. So, right. yeah. Right, that, that, that makes sense. So I have one here from Charles. Can mm -hmm. you talk a bit more about, um, quote, I don't have to like my disability to like myself and tell us a bit more of being in, a, in your dorm room for two months, yeah. Sure. Um, so I have bad days like anybody else. Um, and I got asked a question a little while ago about like what I think about self-love and self-respect. Um, for me, I think that self-love isn't linear. I think what this I, we have this idea that once you love yourself or respect yourself, it's a plateau and you're just gonna sit there and like you're gonna just love yourself in every sin single situation and every single stimuli that comes at you, you're gonna know exactly what to do. And that's just not true. Life changes how we think about things and think about ourselves. Um, and so like the, the metaphor of giving a second chance, I give myself a second chance to do right by myself. Um, and I, I really had to learn that skill because I was terrified that, you know, that even the smallest misstep meant that I couldn't re, um, redirect course, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I don't like, when I'm in pain and when I'm, my brain is just not connected to my legs and my legs won't do what I want them to do, I don't really like my disability in that moment. Um, but I still know that at the end of the day, I have to give myself a second chance um, that it's gonna be better the next day or, um, I don't really have to like my disability. Um, I can respect my body. I can respect what it can do. I can respect what it doesn't do. Um, but I, I really don't see, I really don't feel like that it's a com the completeness of me is like just focusing on this disability. Um, I'm a whole person and I'm gonna have bad days and letting yourself have bad days is important and not spiraling into thinking like you can never um, recover from it is really important. Um, like I said, give yourself a second chance, just understand, give yourself a second chance to understand yourself, understand your boundaries, understand um, the way you move about the world. That's incredibly important. Um, so the reason why I was in a dorm room for two months 
is because I was going to school in Pittsburgh and it had a blizzard um, for, there was like a blizzard for like a week and I was snowed into my room. And uh, so I would like, I fell back on, I fell behind on classes because every time I, every time I tried to leave my room, everything was covered in ice. So I was mm-hmm. slipping and sliding. And this was way before, um, oh my goodness, it was before Skype. Who? <laughs> <laughs> that's very alarming um, but it was before Skype it was before like online um it was before you know tele-education and things like that um and also my teachers were like very unforgiving I would be like hey I can't make it in class can you just send me the homework and I'll try to do self-study um and they wouldn't do it because uh, I hadn't gone through the disability office because I didn't know that I could ask for accommodations in the first place so it was basically like a cascading failure of you know me not being, uh, um, me not knowing how to self advocate in that moment, mm-hmm. uh, and trying to work around the system instead of letting myself have other people help me. So yeah, I was in my room for two months. I ordered a lot of food, mostly burgers. I really mm-hmm. love cheeseburgers. Um, mm-hmm. I just like slept for most of the day because I was so depressed um, after a while because I felt I was so behind in my classes by that point that I couldn't recover. And even by the time spring rolled around and everything was fine outside, I was like, I can't, uh, I can't leave. And I, uh, I have trouble um, where if the longer I'm inside, I get a little bit agoraphobic and it makes it very difficult for me to leave. So all of that was happening at the same time. And my dad was, my mom and dad were constantly calling me. Um, and my parents, <laughs> if you have West Indian family members yeah. or, um, <laughs> or you know, just any, like black family members in general, like if you don't respond, they're coming to get you. Um, so <laughs> my, like it was, uh my dad just like he was like let's go he like he just showed up at my door one day and I didn't I didn't really call I didn't ask for him to come um he just kind of just showed up and he picked me up he's like why we're gonna drop you're gonna drop out we're gonna take some time you're gonna spend as much time as you can in therapy um to kind of heal from all this and when you are ready to return to school we'll make sure we can get that to happen and I'm I'm very privileged in that my dad was able to help me out with that. So, um, but yeah, that's, that's basically the story of me being um, in my dorm room. Also, if you look at a brick wall too closely, you kind of get lost and dizzy, um, just at, out of experience, um, be careful. <laughs> yes. So I, I um, you know, was taking notes while you were talking. One of the, the things, um, the, uh, the disability caucus with, that I'm co-chair with, Mm-hmm. Um, that we're starting the conversation about is this internalized ableism, right? Mm-hmm. And you and you mentioned that, um, and I'm new to this work, you know, myself. So, could you elaborate a little bit more on what that is and how to identify it? I guess would be the question. Maybe in yourself, like how to identify? Oh, this is what I'm doing, you know? Yeah. So, have you ever sat down to do the dishes? Yes, because I have horrible knees. Yeah. And when was By the, the first end of the time? day, they're done. And when, when was the first time you did that? Uh, within this year, because they've, they've been the worst. Yeah. Yeah. Why, why'd you wait so long, though? True. I did because my pride, number one, and mm-hmm. I don't want to look like I can't do it. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, there's so many little tasks we do every day that are either completely unnecessary or they're unnecessary in the way that we do them. Mm-hmm. And it's all to look like, it's all to look more productive um, and we don't really think outside the box in terms of our own accessibility and our own needs because we want to make sure that people know i'm good i don't need anybody's help i'm very productive i can live on my own um, and that's particularly true for black people who are assigned female at birth um, there's a there's a very much of a very intense drive to be seen as constantly working to constantly producing, constantly organizing, whatever it may be, we have to be at it all the time. And so internalized ableism is really kind of, how do you perform on a daily basis in order to be seen as worthy? Not, not necessarily that you're unworthy, in ter- you know, I, I believe everybody has their own 
dignity, autonomy, and worth. I, I believe everybody has that, but what do you do to be seen as that mm -hmm. in this very racist, ableist, capitalistic society that wants to dispose of people who, you know, aren't productive, mm -hmm. aren't, aren't valuable, you know? And so, I, but the exercise I always tell people to do is like, go through your whole day. I want you to write down what you do in that day and not just what you do, but how you do it. Right. Right. And then I want you to like, think about what was actually necessary and what was not. Mm -hmm what were you doing just to do it? Um, and we do this alone too. So my, one of my big behaviors of internalized ableism is I walk fast. I mean, fast for me, but, <laughs> but I, walk, I, I walk at a pace that I should not be walking at um, given my crutches. Um, and I'll do that even alone. I will be on a walk, like on a trail by myself. Nobody's around me, I'll be walking fast. Um, and I'll be out of breath, I'll be uncomfortable, I'll be in pain, I'll still be walking fast. And then one day it just occurred to me, huh, I walk this fast because for my entire life, I was always being told by people behind me that I was holding them up because I'm going so slow. And so that behavior just kind of spiraled and went on and on and on until I literally was like, hmm. I don't actually need to walk fast. I'm not actually going anywhere. I'm not late anywhere. Um, so why am I doing this behavior? Um, and I think a lot of it has to do with, uh, like I said, our, how our society places value on people and what it means to not be valuable. Um, that has always meant death and lack of resources and poverty, like all those things. It means it means the isolation from society as a whole when you are not performing, quote unquote, as you should. So, like I said, what are you doing to be seen as worthy? I'm on mute, forgot. <laughs> no, I was saying that's powerful, very powerful. Thank you. So I have another question here, and this mm -hmm. is really from Sharon Elise, but Charles posted it. Can you talk about the twin pandemics, systemic racism and COVID? And he's actually asking this question. So those two, the, pen, the systemic racism and COVID. Yeah. Um, so well, the pandemic is rough, uh, has been rough for the disability community. Um, it. I think a lot of non-disabled people or people who do not know um, are not familiar with the disability community. Um, they don't know the trauma associated with this pandemic for us because quite literally from jump, from the beginning of the pandemic, we were pouring over medical rationing guidelines that said that we would, if, if in the events that the, a hospital was overcrowded and they needed to allocate resources, they wouldn't give resources to disabled people because we had no quality of life. So they would just let us die. Um, and then on top of that, you have the racist and racism and ableism of the Michael Hickson case, who was a black man who caught COVID, who was a paraplegic. Um, and his wife recorded his doctor saying, I'm not gonna give you any resources. I'm just gonna let you die because there's no point in saving you. Um, his wife caught that on her phone. Oh. Um, and they, uh, and you can look up that case. It, it was out of a Texas Can you hospital. say the name of it again, please? Sure. Michael Hickson, H-I-C-K-S-O-N. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and so that, like, for, particularly for Black disabled people, that was always relaying in the back of our mind. And then on top of that, you have people in your own life, um, whether they're close or not really close at all, debating the value of your life, you know, whether we should open up the economy first, right? Um, whether, you know, it really matters if disabled people die. Um, and this is all very predictable for disabled people because um, the people most likely to harm us are our caregivers and the, and the system itself. Um, and so we knew that from the, from the moment they said it was mostly gonna affect elderly and disabled people, nobody was gonna care. Mm -hmm. um, and when you think, when, when you look back at those statistics of who's actually disabled um, and who has the highest rates of disability, um, indigenous folk and uh, black folk, the 
the the U.S. government sending body bags to indigenous reservations starts to make sense because they literally thought, looked at the numbers and said, "Oh, well, you, most of you are disabled, so a lot of that population is going to pass anyways." And we had been sounding an alarm too on like it being a mass disabling event, and um, which it has been. Millions of people are now disabled from COVID. Mm-hmm. So all of these things, and people are like just really excited to ignore us so all of these things and we're just like trying to warn people hey this is not going to go the way you think it is if you do not prioritize disabled people um on top of all this every single service dropped (laughs) every single service that was that um that disabled people use to live in the community to live um safely dropped you know direct support workers like could no longer be uh around disabled folks um certain day programs shut down uh Mm -hmm. like everything just halted and we're still picking up the pieces there's a direct support worker shortage right now um and there are wait lists so i don't know if you know about the wait list system but like there are wait lists for services in every single state in the state of pennsylvania there are twelve thousand people on the wait list um every single state has a different number i was told to be put on the wait list um when I was two in the hopes that I would get services by the time I was 18. What? So, so services, yeah, it's very, very difficult to get services, um, especially if you want to actually keep your child in the community. Um, so yeah, like it's everything kind of stopped at the same time. And then on top of that, you have like the um, Black Lives Matter movement and mm-hmm. the racial uprising in 2020 and I will say black people are getting better about talking about disability but it still feels very much so like when we talk about disability a lot of people think white people um and so when we were saying black disabled lives matter there was also white disabled people going well all disabled lives matter it's the same exact dynamics just with disability attached um so it's really been (laughs) I, like there's so many different different uh different things that went on at all at the same time it was very rough and it has been rough like I was getting ulcers from the stress of the last two years um yeah it's been really really hard and I don't yeah it's COVID really shone a light on a lot of systems that are just not functioning mm-hmm. um and even more so just how society feels about disabled people. And I think that you cannot be anti-racist without being anti-ableist. And so watching people just dismiss the lives of disabled people and not knowing that the dynamics of disability and the, and the racial makeup of disability um, is really disturbing. Um, and eugenics, unfortunately, is extremely prevalent in our society. Mm-hmm. and we people debate the value of our lives every single day but in a crisis that's not something you want um right i hope that answered the question yeah yes. I, I feel like there's so many other things that could be i could like talk about in relation to those things like i have to stop at some point because it's just it's overwhelming mm-hmm. no that that was the answer was on point so I have another one from Talitha. In many of our campus trainings, we are instructed to use quote unquote, person first language for disabled people. This is a good one. But many disability activists argue against this framing. Can you give us your perspective on this for educators? educators. Yeah, so I first wanna give you a little bit of history as to where person first language comes from. Um, so I used to be like a very ardent identity first language person um, because I was like, I'm a disabled person if you can't say it, that's not my problem. Um, so so <laughs> I was like very much so combative about it. And then I started reading up on the history of disability activism and where person first language kind of originated from. So back in the um, back in the 60s and 70s, alongside the civil rights movement um, and all of that, you know, social uprising that was going on was the disability rights movement. Actually out of Berkeley, California. Um, and they started really with transportation protests. Um, but back in that day, there were, there's a large number of disabled people that were institutionalized, right? And a Geraldo Rivera report, back when he actually did journalism, um, 
he did a report on the, the conditions of this place called Willowbrook. Now you can look up the document, uh, excuse me, the documentary trailer on YouTube. I trigger it, every trigger warning available. Um, it is very disturbing. Um, the conditions of those institutions, like children on the floor, unclothed in filth, in um, in detritus. It was it was really bad. Um, so that kind of created an entire uproar. And disabled people were kind of like, yeah, you kind of just like, un, you know, shove us in the corner and really kind of move us about as you see fit, but you never ask us about our own lives. But we are people first. I'm a person with a disability. So that's really where the person first started. It was like around the disability rights movement of that era. So you'll see a lot of older disabled people using it, as well as people who were taught about disability. Um, before, I would say before the 2000s, there was a huge push. And society never really kept up with the conversations being had about disabled people um, amongst themselves. Because we, another thing to take into account is that non-disabled people are very infantilizing towards disabled people. Mm -hmm. um, so when, dis when disabled people um, online or in these activist spaces say, I'm a disabled person, there's still the, this need to correct disabled people, right? And say, well, I learned person first, so that's what I'm sticking with. My recommendation would be to just ask, like, do you prefer disabled person or person with a disability? And there may be other terminology that they like to use, um, but that's really the, where the history of that comes from and um, why it's important to know it. <laughs> because, you know, for, for a lot of people, they're still very much of the mind, you know, I, I wanted to tell people I'm a person first. Um, yeah, I hope that helps answer your question. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, it does. So I'm looking to see, I don't see another one here. I'm gonna see if any of our other uh, panelists, Scott or anyone has a question, because I don't want to take up everyone's question time, but my questions. Oh, uh, I have a question, if that's okay. Uh, thank you so much. This has been really incredible. You're wonderful. Uh, thank you. Uh, so also, uh, you have a, a Twitter account and you talk about social media. So I wanted to ask about your Twitter, how effective, how did you get into that? It's, could you? Uh... Yeah, so my running, my running gag about my Twitter account is that um, when I started writing my blog, I would only, like I would send it to my, to my family and then like my family stopped reading it because I would kept sending it to them. And then my mom said like, you need to find some friends you could show this to. So that's kind of really how I started my social media account. Um, but the disability activism really didn't start until I started interviewing other disabled people about their experiences. Um, specifically, I, I interviewed the, Crypt, the, the founders of Crypt the Vote, um, Alice Wong, Greg Baratan, Andrew Plorang. Um, and then from there, uh, a somebody wrote a BuzzFeed article about like disability activists you should know. And I was one of them, which was weird because I had like written three posts by this time. <laughs> um, so I was confused, but I was grateful, <laughs> confused, but grateful. Um, so uh, yeah, so I started just like really wanting to talk to other disabled people and more and more, the more I talked about my own experiences, the more other disabled people related. Um, and then I started using hashtags to create conversations around things. Um, my favorite one was when I, I didn't necessarily harass Brian Cranston. That's not the word I would use, but um, he was in a movie where he played a disabled person um, in a uh, in a wheelchair, and I was I really was like, well, is is there any incentive for Hollywood to include disabled people in uh, film production and things like that? It was so, and somebody had had said, I th um, I think it was Brian Cranston had said that like disabled people don't have the experience to be in film or something like that. And I was just like, actually, there are a lot of things disabled people know. So I started the hashtag things disabled people know and disabled people talk about their expertise and you know um, how disability is not really portrayed well in the media and things like that. Um, I also had did Ables are weird and because non-disabled people are really weird. Um, very bizarre behavior from all of you. No I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> but you know, just to, just to build community. And I think it's really important to create like to create hashtags because you can simultaneously get the personal story and the numbers so you could get the personal story to, to for everybody to relate to one another and to speak their truth 
but you get the numbers for not just able to realize just how prevalent of an issue something is. Like when they see thousands of tweets um, uh, talking about ableism in society, they're like, oh, this is a bigger problem than I thought it was. Um, and it gives, it makes them uh, take a pause and really kind of understand how they are complicit in behaving that way. So um, that's my, so that was Twitter. Um, and then I also have TikTok, Instagram. And if I'm on Facebook, it's uh, under duress. <laughs> I'm laughing. <laughs> that's funny. That's pretty, no, yeah. I'm only on Facebook, but you know, I think it's an age thing for me. Yeah. Understandable. Understandable. Mm -hmm. So you are an influencer now, right? Is that? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's really awkward. Like that work. <laughs> it's very awkward because um, I, I <laughs> like every every so often I'll like do a sponsored post and my mom will be like, oh, interesting what you're selling over there. Can I tell you, can I ask you what brands you decided to work with? Because one of them was um, an adult toy store and she was very alarmed by just like the, the influencer like need to, it was a whole thing but yeah that's a good one yeah you know i saw i, I wasn't sure something about the twin pandemic i guess you've talked a little about yes that, but, right yeah she already <laughs> did that one um so i was thinking is there a takeaway because you know there's a lot of faculty here right and there may be people who are not faculty but you know, since it's a CFA event, I'm going to say that there's a lot of, is there a takeaway that you can send us off forth, you know, to, for our classes, for our students, engaging with each other, even CFA, you know, we're trying to make ourselves better. I remember back in the day where we didn't have interpreters, right? You know, you know we weren't on Zoom, so there was no closed caption. I, you know, I remember, uh, went back to my bad knees, which is not really my main disability, but you know, being embarrassed to ask for help up and down a podium kind of thing, you know. And so, but now, you know, I spoke up like you're talking about and now that's accommodated. But what can CFA or us as faculty, you know, what's our takeaway that you can send us forth with? Sure, um, I would want you to stick with the, a couple. Racism mm -hmm. is inherently disabling. Mm -hmm. um, understand that systems are at play to disable and to discard of people. Um, Two is combat your own internalized ableism. Um, mm -hmm. It's okay to need help. It's okay to be fearful of the perceptions of disability in society. It is okay to um, be fearful of what a disability identity means, but understand that you don't have to outperform other people's perceptions of you. Um, who you are is gonna be who you are. So be comfortable with it. You don't always have to like it. You don't always have to feel at that plateau of self-love, but be comfortable in your own skin. Um, and lastly, to never assume capacity. Uh, I, I can't tell you how many times that we, that we isolate people on the, with the thought process, well, they can't. You know, I, I don't think that they can, let, like, let me just exclude them automatically. Right. Um, but everybody has the capacity to do great good or great harm. And this also includes, um, the fact that we see a lot of disabled um, racists and white supremacists, like everybody has cap the capacity to be a human being and allowing them to be as such lets you see where the cracks lie um, or where your own ableism is getting in the way of inclusion and inclusivity. So those are the three main things I would ask you to walk away with this. Nice. And I'm stalling to see because we're going we're going to run out of time soon, and it goes fast. If there's any other comments or anyone has a question, um, because soon our time will be up. Yeah, and, um, and feel free to follow me on social media and ask me questions. Um, oh, can I ask? It's maybe not that important of a question, but you know, you studied at the Sor Sorbonne. So, so that was, there was, was it in French? You know, that must have been a chat. What was that experience like not being in another culture and all that? Yeah. So I studied at the Sorbonne for my undergrad, but I also uh, got my master's degree in Paris. Uh, I have a master's in global communication from the American University of Paris. Um, and studying abroad uh, is very nerve wracking. Um, mm -hmm. My recommendation is if you're going to travel as a person with a disability or as somebody who has mobility needs, 
is to, to like really research the age of a city um, because yeah. the older it is, the, the least accessible I find it to be. And um, it was very difficult to get around Paris. Um, one of the things that like people don't take into account is that all the sidewalks slant towards the middle of the street um, for drainage. Um, and so I was always walking at an angle, which hurt my back so bad. Um, but I loved it. I had a really good time. I lived there for about, off and on for about three years. Um, I speak, so I speak French um, and I, <laughs> uh, and I, the Sorbonne is really interesting because Americans have a very complicated history with being corrected. Um, so like when, when your teacher's just correcting you, they're like, you like you you want to like crawl inside or something like, oh my god I'm a failure I'll never do this again um but there uh, it's a cultural difference my professor was just like are you done like just do it right the next time um so yeah there was a lot of cultural differences the food was great um ironically I had a friend that went to grad school with me who does not like French food which was hilarious to watch her try to eat food um <laughs> But yeah, I had a really great time. I, I really enjoyed myself. That's amazing. Yeah. I have one comment in here from Gilda. Um, it says, I have spent most of my life training adults to become teachers. Mm -hmm. Teachers receive little to no training around disabilities, visible or invisible disabilities. I would like to see CFA have you speak to the C California Commission for Teaching Credentialing about the disability issue. Could you talk to this issue around teacher training and thank you for your talk today. You are most appreciated. But the issue around teacher training around these issues. Yeah, so I, specifically at the collegiate level, I think that there's a lot of room for improvement. When, you're, when you are um, K through 12, like there are a lot of systems in place like IEPs and 504 plans that kind of set up a framework for accessibility. But um, college is really like the first time that a disabled person has to advocate for themselves and their parents really can't help. Um, and so it's really important that teachers ha have a, some knowledge of disability, not just disability, but what accommodations are available from their university um, and, so, and play a really active role in connecting students with their accommodations or with the resources that they may need to succeed. I, I mean, there are so many areas in which I want people to be credentialed in disability. Education is one, mental health is one. Um, and I really do think it is important that you understand um, nuances about disability in the disability community, as well as you know how disability affects things like race, gender, and sexuality. Um, so I really do think it is important for teachers to have a, a really robust understanding because it's particularly in college, they, you don't know how to advocate for yourself. I mean, for me, I had my parents advocating with me since I was like six years old. And still by the time I got to college, I was, I was thrown for a loop. Um, so yeah, just, I would really encourage you to do that. I think that's an excellent idea. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I know that there are several like disability groups um, and several disability in academia, um, like Twitter accounts and uh, Facebook pages and all those types of things um that are dedicated to making academia more accessible so i would look into those i have to I, if i come across them in my feed i'll try to send them your way so that you all can take a look but yeah i do really think more people should be credentialed and you mentioned the counselors which tricked in my mind i was like right yeah the counselors too we already have an issue with not enough counselors uh, yeah. especially tenure line counselors in the CSU, they're seeing way too much, they're responsible for way too many students at one time. But now I'm thinking, oh, and I wonder what kind of training is there, how we can help them more, uh, yeah. you know, in this issue. Yeah, because a lot of people don't, a lot of people really kind of minimize the effect of mental health and just medical professionals in general, of their effects on the disability community and a disabled person's life. What happens in a, in a hospital room or in a counseling session can really impact your day to day. Um, and so I, the reason why I want counselors to be trained on disability is because a, a lot of people specifically like women and people who are assigned female at birth, they, they are often um, put into conservatorships against their will, 
yeah. on the basis that they have mental health issues that, that means that they cannot um enact in society autonomously so i really like i that's a really big passion of mine because when i was going to therapists i went to a, a black therapist great she was excellent on issues of race but i constantly found myself having to explain to her i'm not upset about my disability i'm upset because people treat me differently because of my disability and i can't just ignore that because it impacts the way i i move about the world literally quite literally move about the world so i've always found myself having to explain to my therapists what my disability identity means and how trying how to get them to not be able <laughs> about the way that they interact with me mm-hmm. so that's always a little rough wow my brain is like <laughs> things that i've not thought about <laughs> yeah i try to keep it keep it coming keep all that mm-hmm, knowledge mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. any other questions for anybody right i don't see one in any in the q a thank you charles so uh, I would, yeah, I think we're almost out of time. And so this has been wonderful. I think it's really great to have you here, especially as the first speaker in this equity conference. So thank you. Yes. Yeah, we should Fabulous. applaud you. Fabulous.